Hey everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Reagan Canope. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. I know the 90s were a wild time in politics, but at least in the last 10 years that I've been paying close attention, I think this was a particularly challenging session. Things fell apart. Republican senators walked out of the Capitol. There was a, essentially like a log jam at the Senate floor. So bills were coming over from the House, which continued to function, but nothing could actually make it past the Senate floor. So there ended up being like literally hundreds of bills waiting to be heard on the Senate floor. And I think the legislative session could be broken up into three distinct acts. Oregon law imposes several ethical obligations on state and local public officials. State law also regulates and requires reporting by lobbyists. Harang Long PC's lawyers work with public officials and lobbyists who need advice on how to comply with government ethics rules. We also represent clients before the Oregon Government Ethics Commission when they are accused of violating those rules. Our deep experience with government ethics helps us evaluate issues efficiently and offer practical advice in what can often be contentious and politically charged circumstances. To learn more about Harang Long's government ethics practice, go to harang.com. That's H-A-R-R-A-N-G.com. All right, folks, uh, we are back with our first post-legislative session podcast episode uh, Reagan, I'm exhausted. Um, how are you feeling? I forgot I was a co-host with you on this podcast, Ben. We've done so many episodes apart, and it's just really glad. Uh, I'm really glad. And maybe Buddy will fix this, or maybe he won't. It's fine. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad that we're reunited. And um, honestly, Ben, I can say I've been doing Vacation Bible School at my church uh, this week. And I would have done 160 days of vacation Bible school before I did 160 days of the legislative session, or rather I would be less tired after dealing with kids for 160 days than I would be with the adults that we sent to this uh, government building, Benjamin. So many jokes to be made about children and adults and politicians that I will just yep. leave on the table. Um, okay. So here's what this episode is. Today's episode is Reagan and I, we've went through probably a couple dozen um, newspaper articles, um, press releases, et cetera. Ben, what are newspapers? Uh, <laughs> news articles. Thank you. Good ah, point. there we go. That's, that's good. I don't know what a newspaper is. I'm going to have to uh, this. If you're interested in the decline of local news, we've done a couple podcast episodes on that. Um, but we've reviewed a bunch of the news reporting on this, and um, we have sort of pulled what we think are some of the, the big ticket items, the highlights from the last legislative session. Um, we're going to talk a little bit at the beginning about the sort of broad framework of what happened this session um but we're we're going to try both reagan and i to minimize our political editorializing um although maybe at the end we'll we'll get a little bit into how people are talking about the session aside from the things that were actually accomplished um because it was i mean i think fair to say reagan one of the most tense or uh divisive perhaps uh legislative sessions in modern Oregon history. Does that seem fair? Ben, I think that as every election that is upcoming is the most important election of our lifetime, the most recent legislative session was the most divisive in our lifetime spent. I don't think that's fair. I think I did. This was the longest walkout in Oregon history. Um, I know they're, they're like the 90s were a wild time in politics, but at least in the in the last 10 years that I've been paying close attention, I think this was uh, this was a particularly challenging session. But We'll put a pause on editorializing. Reagan, let's talk about sort of, I'll, I'll offer my framework for how I think about, thought about the session, and then I'll welcome your critiques or, or an alternative way of thinking about it. So um, I was listening to a podcast with Jane Fonda and Jane Fonda says that she thinks of her life in three acts, like a three act play, um, mm -hmm. the first 30 years, the second 30 years, and then the final 30 years. And I think the legislative session can be, this legislative session could be broken up into three distinct acts, not of equal distance or, or equal length, I should say. Um, first act is the beginning of session. And 
there was basic functionality on both sides. Bills were moving through the process. Public hearings were being scheduled. Floor sessions were happening. Everybody, for the most part, was participating. Um, there was a subtext of rising tension, literally from the moment that leadership elections took place, particularly in the Senate. Um, there were barbs being traded in press releases and comments, to newspapers. Um, that happens basically every session, though probably not to the lengths that we saw this session. Um, and again, it was mostly subtext. The the actual happenings of the legislature uh, were ongoing. Okay, so that's the, the the first act. The first act is like basic functionality. The second act is when the walkout begins, which it looks like is early May, according to reporting um, from the Associated Press. That is when things fell apart. Um, Republican senators walked out of the Capitol, um, denying quorum for uh, for floor sessions. That being said, many Republican senators were actually attending committee meetings um, in the Senate. So some work was happening, but there was a essentially like a log jam at the Senate floor. So bills were coming over from the House, which continued to function basically the same as it did uh, in the first act. Um, but nothing could actually make it past the Senate floor. So there ended up being like literally hundreds of bills waiting to be heard on the Senate floor. Um, this middle section was, I would say, the highest degree of uncertainty possible. There were people who were th who believed that literally, like there's public reporting on this. You can read legislators' comments saying like, we've given up on the session. All the bills are going to die. The governor is going to call a special session and then we'll get everything. Oh, well, not everything. We'll get the budget budget, budget bills done in a special session. But all the stuff we worked on is dead. I think probably, Reagan, you and I both held that belief at one point or another uh, during the walkout. Um, but it also like the, the rumors were flying all over the place. The reporting was up and down. Like you would hear that people were talking and, you know, the governor comes into the negotiating process at one point. The presiding officers are meeting at one point. Other senators come in to, to negotiate at some point. Republican House members are trying to negotiate with Republican Senate members to come back. Like there's all this movement happening. Total uncertainty. Um, very unclear what the end of the session would yield. And then we get to the final act which really is just like a couple weeks, I guess. Um, it's 11, it was 11 days, Ben, essentially. 11 days of session that were left between when the senators provided quorum and signee die. And signee die happened with hours to go before midnight. It was like late afternoon, right, Ben? That is correct. So the final act is just an incredibly rapid pace of bills passing through both chambers. But I will say the Senate in particular, like they had this big backlog and it's basically like if you, you know, removed a dam from a river, like the bills are just flowing out. I will editorialize and say not great for democracy, in my opinion, for bills to not go through a public process. Um, well, they did go through a public process. It was just an extremely abbreviated public process without the degree of scrutiny that I would say you would normally see in the legislative process. Um, that being said, when all is said and done, Reagan, I don't know. We'll talk about the, the sort of compromise here, but there was nothing that I know of that died because we ran out of time, for example. Maybe a couple. There was, there was one article today about some yes. um, justice funding that got missed. and But I'm not sure that's walkout related, to be perfectly honest, because the budget writing was happening the entirety of the session. So I know it's been characterized that way. I'm, I, I don't have enough facts to say that that is for sure. I think there were some bills that were because the process we have a two chamber process each of the chambers have deadlines and you have to have you have deadlines for how many bills you can work and get out of your uh, chamber they have to be worked by or they have to be posted for a work session by a certain date and then they have to be voted out by another date and you have uh, most of the bills that die after that first chamber deadline most bills don't get a hearing most bills don't move and then you trade the any number of bills between chambers so that the second chamber process for house bills is where things definitely got stuck because they'd go on the first readings list and they'd be there and they wouldn't move up on the first reading list. They couldn't get referred to committee. I'd say those bills, some of them did end up going, but I think there's probably a chunk of those that didn't um, move forward. And that's probably where the biggest hang up was, but most everything else did get dealt with. And we usually do run up to the end. Um, then just the session always, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> 
I was reading the other day. I can't remember the name of it, but there's some theory about however much space you give a project uh, and however much budget you get in it and however much manpower you get, it'll take all of that. And so when you give the section 160 days, it takes the 160 days. It's very rare to sunny die much before the actual sunny die date, yeah. at least in my experience. But That's yes, fine. I think generally you've characterized everything correctly. I love your three acts play, Ben. Um, I wish I could uh, trademark this session and then uh, sell it to Lynn manuel Miranda to do Organs Hamilton. So I think it'd be great. I think it'd be awesome. I think there'd be fantastic songs. Um, I think you would probably pass, but we could probably convince Netflix to give us some money for like, a, you know, like one of those Netflix movie, original movies that like, they, like seven people watch, but they they will make everything just like um, <laughs> just, just like Hallmark does. Um, apologies to all of our Hallmark fans out there. <laughs> okay. So um, I think I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to leave that there for now. And then Reagan, let's get into some of the big categories. I think we can move relatively quickly through this. Um, these are some of the big ticket items that happened this session when all was said and done. I will, I will caveat by saying most of our listeners probably know this, or at least our more experienced listeners, but I think most um, Oregonians are not aware of this, which is um, the vast majority of legislation that is voted on in both chambers is bipartisan, meaning that, in fact, they, mm -hmm. they did a mid-session checkup and it's like, at one point it was over 85%, I think it's close to 90% by the end of session of bills are supported by at least some Democrats and at least some Republicans. Um, and that largely has to do with the type of bills. Like I listened to Nigel Jaquis on the Willamette Week, um, the Dive podcast, and he was talking about like, he, do, he was describing them as like, things that both sides can agree on, mostly small in nature. Some of them are technical fixes, things that agencies need to be able to do their work. Like vast majority of stuff is relatively uncontroversial and moves through. Then there's like a second tier, which is like somewhat controversial. Like maybe the Republicans, since it's a, you know, democratically controlled in both chambers, the Republicans like push back a little bit, but it's no big deal. And then there's like the top tier, which are the ones that get the most press without fail. Um, House Bill 2002 on abortion and gender affirming care, House Bill 2005 on um, gun safety slash um, gun control laws, um, SGR 33, which was about the constitutional uh, amendment about gender affirming care, excuse me, gender identity, abortion and, and um, marriage equality. Uh, were there any other that you'd put in that like top category of conflict? Um, yeah, I mean, generally, a lot of the environmental issues tend to be pretty contentious, and some of them got worked out, some of them didn't, some of them passed, some of them didn't. Um, I would say some of the tax issues were somewhat controversial, and then um, you have what 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 one of my favorite is like the issues where we deal with all session where they're just like hot and controversial and then all of a sudden we come to an agreement and then they're just like everyone forgets they were controversial <laughs> and there were so many of those i can't even remember totally um but yes and i think to talk about um one of those underlying things that we didn't talk about um that you put in the notes ben but we didn't really cover there was a there was as is usual <laughs> I had a Republican staffer in the House tell me uh, Democrats are the opponent, but the Senate is the enemy. <laughs> and there there was uh, and, and that was not, by the way, related to the lockout. That's just normal capital vibes where you have your bicameral legislature and and there's jokes about senators going for a naps and and um, members members being house trained, meaning they've they've gone through the House. And so they know how to do legislative business. And I always joke that the House exists to fill open Senate seats. Um, that and so it's, it's disgusting, Ben. Um, <laughs> honestly, it's just offensive. I apologize on behalf of myself. I joked all session about joke. I joked all session about introducing a bill to create a unicameral legislature and abolish the Senate. Um, and I think there's a move least... to Nebraska, Ben. <laughs> you want that? Move to Nebraska. <laughs> I do think there's a handful. So what I will say about that, Reagan, before you go to the second dynamic, is um, I do think particularly this session. The House side felt particularly angry about the Senate side. And I think this is partisanship aside because yeah. we were moving on the House side, many of the Senate bills through the process, but all the House bills 
um, were stuck on the Senate side. So again, House doesn't walk out. House Republicans don't walk out. Senate Republicans do. So there's a sort of imbalance depending on where a bill started in the legislative um, in which chamber the bill started in. So that contributed to- I, I uh, might go study how many Senate bills compared to House bills normally pass and go see if there's a way to pull that data. That would be super fascinating to see. Because yeah. I bet you're right. I bet it does show a higher percentage of bills being Senate bills. Um, second dynamic, we don't have to talk too much about Democrats versus Republicans. But what I was going to highlight on this- Ben, do, do the two major political parties disagree? There are occasional disagreements, and I will add there yeah. are three political parties represented in the Oregon State Legislature. There is that's right. Sen Senator Brian Boquist is an independent and represents the Independent Party of Oregon, and their Twitter account definitely does not have anything to say about that ever. <laughs> is uh, is Art Robinson? He just caucuses. He is a registered Republican who caucuses with uh, Senator Boquist. Okay, um, okay. Okay, so the, well, the the only dynamic on that that I would uh, c contribute that I think um, I found interesting was it was not this session as simple as like Democrats on one side and Republicans on the other. Um, certainly on some things there were, that's always going to be true, but there was tension among the Republicans for sure. There's also different approaches that different types of Democrats wanted to take to get through the sort of log jam standoff. I will say... And Reagan, maybe you'll disagree with this, but like on the Republican side, the tension, the inter inter party tension seemed really apparent because when the deal was struck, um, some Republicans were in the building and others chose never to come back, even though their votes could have saved um, a couple bills at the end that I think uh, members of their caucus would have liked. And that's true on both in both chambers. There were some House members who refused to come back to the floor after the deal was cut. Um, so I don't think. I think there there is a lot of tension uh, both between and within the both political parties. I think it's just a difference in strategy, Ben, and I can totally see both sides of the strategy. And um, I, no surprise, um, liked the version that we came out with in terms of being able to come to a bipartisan conclusion on a lot of those bills, but totally respect everybody uh, and their opinions on how things uh how how they decided to handle things and i think that everybody's got to represent their districts and do their best doing that and i've always told candidates and i've told you this ben that you should just be who you are and represent your district the way you think they ought to be represented and they'll either return you or not and i think that that is what kind of makes our system really great um and makes it uh kind of lame that putin gets continuously reelected with 98% of the vote um, because that just doesn't represent reality. So um, yeah, no, I think you're, I think you're right in terms of there were, there were, as there always are disagreements about strategy and history really is going to judge who was right probably on that. Or maybe we'll never know because you don't get to try out. There's no Oregon legislature multiverse. Unfortunately, there's a lot of multiverses out there, Ben, you might, you, you're not big into the comic book movies, but you probably heard about the multiverse. And saw um, a spider, a Spider-Man movie where there was a spider pig, which was about that. I you think. went and saw that movie. I did. It was a good movie. It was good. Did there's you that, like it? Oh, great. A, I'm, I'm going to go see that one here soon. There's a sequel out now. No, I, I'm talking about the first version. I think oh, you saw the original. Yes. yes. You should watch the sequel. I'm going to go see the sequel. All right. Uh, okay. What happened this legislative session? Let's start with some budget highlights. Um, important thing to note on the budget situation in May there was what is called the May revenue forecast. This is the last uh, revenue forecast of the biennium that basically it's the prediction that the legislative economists make about how much money the state is going to collect in taxes for the next biennium. Um, that revenue forecast was remarkably optimistic uh, and projected lots of additional, I think like 1.9 billion in additional revenue being collected. That is incredibly important because as you're about to see, we're, we're going to talk about some of these numbers. Without that $2 billion increase, um, this is a very different session uh, on a lot of different levels because I think some of the most, as is true for most sessions, many of the things that the legislators are going to talk about and the media is going to talk about involve dollar signs. Um, so mm -hmm. here's here's some of the big ticket items. Well, and one, one thing I want to say about that, Ben, just, just for people who aren't as familiar, the revenue forecast matters because if you guess that you have um if you guess you're gonna have a lot of revenue and you don't have a lot of revenue you have gigantic budget shortfalls that re 
that require cuts, which no one really likes doing and tend to cause a lot of consternation amongst various agencies and the organizations who, who um, re uh, rely on those agencies. If you guess that you won't have a lot of revenue and you do have a lot, um, you get like what we're going to have um, in the upcoming, the next, not this tax year, but next tax year, I think, which is a gigantic kicker. Um, and if you are, uh, if you're right, then you uh, win all the proceeds from the Oregon lottery for that year, I think is how it works, Ben. <laughs> which never happens. Uh, okay. Nearly number one issue going into session, both parties, I think, um, governor's office, housing and homelessness. Um, yes. Nearly $2 billion was invested in a variety of different programs um, in housing and homelessness. $10.2 billion was allocated to the state schools fund. Uh, state school fund, this is the uh, pot of money that is distributed to districts across the state. Um, advocates were asking for 10.3, um, but because of that May revenue forecast and some changing numbers, the number that came out was 10.2. And this is essentially considered current service level um, by most of the agreement. That was up from like a nightmare scenario in the governor's recommended budget of 9.9, .9, I think. 9.9 was 9.9 was um co-chairs the co-chairs budget 9.5 was the lfo quote current service level which we should just do an episode on that because it's a fascinating wonky little thing but it matters a great deal but Mo most districts said all the numbers between below 10.3 are cuts budgets yes so. yes um, and in some districts, 10.2 <clears throat> and 10.3 will be a cuts budget. Like that is indisputable. Some districts, even with that amount, yep. will, will make cuts. Um, $3.7 billion for higher education. This is considered a big win by the folks in the higher ed world. This is more than I think most anticipated they would be receiving. $100 million for a drought package. Um, mm -hmm. This was led by, on the House side at least, by Representative Mark Owens, a Republican from Crane, and Representative Ken Helm um, from Beaverton. Uh, $153 million in behavioral health investments. This is building on the record investments that were made the last biennium. I think they invested over a billion dollars in behavioral health then. Um, and then, yes, Reagan, you've added uh, the I-5 bridge, which a uh, billion dollar commitment over 10 years using, I believe, yep. general obligation bonds. $250 million were committed in this session. There's not a lot of policy details that go with it. It's basically just like an IOU to Washington and the federal government, um, who are also committing a billion dollar, well, Washington's a billion or maybe a little more, and then the feds come in with um, much more than a billion, if I understand correctly. And then there was also, um, there was a pretty hotly debated and actually bipartisan sponsored bill to ban flavored tobacco um, in the state. And I mean, my belief is that there was a, because we have t taxes on tobacco, the revenue hit associated with that ban is what resulted in it not moving forward. But that is me speculating. I have no, uh, no knowledge to that fact. It's not unusual for a bill to die because of the fiscal attached to it, the cost. That's attached. correct. That's correct. Ben. Um, okay. So those are the budget highlights. Reagan, yep. uh, legislative referrals. So every session, the legislature, I won't say every session because I haven't checked, but most sessions, the legislature takes a couple of items up that are considered to be significant policy changes to usually the Constitution because um, we have citizens initiative here in Oregon. And so you can change state law with a lower threshold of signatures. It's like 120 to 130,000 signatures, if I remember correctly. I probably don't. And it's like 160, 175,000 signatures to get on the ballot, a change to the constitution. And those changes are voted on by Oregon, Oregonians at the next regularly scheduled general election in November uh, in even numbered years. And the legislature has referred uh, two items, three items, excuse me, and took up a fourth um, that was a casualty of, of the walkout. So an independent commission, the first one's an independent commission that is going to be filled with not political appointees, um, but pay compensation and HR experts who will determine and set a pay for 
um, elected officials. This includes statewide offices like the governor and the treasurer and the attorney general, uh, the secretary of state. Uh, legislators are included in that. Judges are included in that. And elected district attorneys are included in that. And that's big because Oregon has had um, and over the over the years, especially this last couple of sessions, there were a lot of uh, there's a lot of challenges with the pay for some legislators who just can't make the finances work um, because Oregon legislators are are paid uh, for a part time job that probably is more work than a part time job, uh, and so there there was um, there's a lot of challenges associated with that. But the decision about raising pay tends to get pretty political, and so it's going to be taken out of the hands of the politicians so if the voters make the decision to pass SJR. 34 on the ballot to be a little bit more explicit than you just were there reagan the reason why this is happening in my view is because there is no worse vote for a politician to make than to raise their own salary regardless of, regardless of how low that salary may be or how modest the increase may be it is absolutely the subject of um political attack ads bad i would argue bad faith political attack ads um this this is like a a, a well worn uh, tactic I think probably in both parties um, across the country over the last you know fifty years um, so that's why that's happening um, I will say what I find interesting about this is it includes both there's all there's been a long conversation about legislator pay in Oregon um, Reagan you alluded to former representative Rachel Prusak current power and Anna Williams who all resigned citing the low legislative pay as one of the reasons for leaving yep. but this does also include our statewide elected officials the attorney general who I think is either the I think the second lowest paid attorney general in the country. Um, good, like, good friend of the bod treasurer Tobias Reed is the lowest paid statewide elected official in Oregon. And I don't know about the country, but certainly in Oregon. Um, but like the attorney general, I believe is probably the lowest paid attorney in the department of justice, which is just, uh, uh, hey, attorneys not, not historically known Ben for making very little money. True. Not. And, and the guy, like, and what I find most egregious of all, we, I think we've debated maybe even on this podcast. Um, the governor's compensation. I don't think anyone thinks it should be as low it is now as it is now, um, which is like nine. It's definitely less than a hundred thousand um, yep. dollars. So anyway, sorry for the interruption. What's it? What no, is you're your, totally, totally your, favorite, right. so, your favorite referral is next? Ben, um, ranked choice voting is not my favorite referral. <laughs> oh, I but I will do my best to describe it in a nonpartisan fashion. Um, so ranked choice voting is a our, our current elections are held the first past the post voting system, which means regardless of how many candidates are on your general election ballot, of which there could be multiple. Um, usually there's two. In most competitive elections, there's two. Um, sometimes there's three or four or five, depending on how many minor parties participate. And in Oregon, the major parties have state run primaries. The minor parties run their own primaries and nominate candidates according to some set um, requirements, and they have to maintain a certain threshold of, of um, party membership in order to maintain their minor party status. And so those minor parties can put candidates on the general election ballot, but no matter who gets, uh, but no matter how many candidates there are, the person who gets the most votes. And so we saw in our three-way governor election that Tina Kotick was the largest vote receiving candidate and became the governor under that system. However, um, we didn't run a ranked choice voting election, so we wouldn't know the outcome, but she did not get over 50% of the vote. Mm -hmm. um, so ranked choice voting allows voters to rank the candidates that they like in some form of order. Um, and the details of this aren't worked out. They The voters have to pass this ranked choice voting uh, ballot measure and then have it be implemented so we know the exact details. But anyway, you rank the candidates and then the candidate who gets the least amount of votes is eliminated. And then they rerun the election and reallocate the votes of people who voted for their first choice who was eliminated to their second choice. And the idea is that this results in um, only two candidates left at the end, um, or they stop when one candidate reaches 51, 50 point one percent of the vote or 50 percent plus one percent of the vote um and the goal is to have a majority of voters elect the candidate um that wins the election so um after the uh so this so this was brought into the legislature it was amended had amendments it was amended it applies to U u.s senate 
Congress, statewide elections, and local elections by opt-in, the elections that don't aren't included in this is state legislature. Um, and I think that's a source of some debate because I think um, here's where I'm going to editorialize just a tad bit and feel free to push back because I know that you are uh, deeply in love with ranked choice voting. And uh, so I'm going to push back on a couple of things. One, I haven't seen, and this is just me editorializing again, haven't seen a lot of circumstances where the ranked choice vote changes significantly from the first past the post and that most of the candidates who went under first past the post also went under ranked choice voting. Um, we already elect candidates with less than 50% of the vote because there's a population called non-voting people. Um, and so a majority of voters choose, but a majority of people do not, any candidate. Uh, thirdly, exempting the legislature is confusing. Uh, and so that will cause the top of your ballot to be ranked choice, the middle of your ballot not to be ranked choice, and the bottom of your ballot to be either or or ranked choice for city and county elections and special district elections um, based on the, the decision of either local voters or local elected officials in that district opting in and out of it. So, um, Ben, if I got any of the details wrong, feel free to uh, put me on the blast, as they say. That is not what they say. And what I will say oh. is I like that the bill, I like a couple of things about ranked choice voting. But one thing I like is that it empowers people to vote for the candidate that they believe in and not have to make some calculation about who has the best chance of winning and what if there's a spoiler effect and blah, 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 blah. Um, there have been several prominent elections Two, I think we've talked about this on the podcast. One is um, Gore versus Bush 2000. Nader in California gets enough votes that Gore's numbers are down. This is obviously subject to debate. People, different people to believe different things. George W. Bush wins. So the people who voted for Nader, who probably are more closely aligned with Al Gore in most cases, um, actually get not their, like they voted for their number one choice. And instead of their second, their number two choice getting it, the like opposite of their choice gets it. Similar thing happened in Oregon in the 1990 governor's election where Al Mobley, a far right conservative activist, strips enough votes away from Dave Fronmeyer that uh, Barbara Roberts becomes a governor. Those outcomes, uh, while I'm very glad that Barbara Roberts got elected governor and I would have preferred that Al Gore uh, became president, um, strike me as undemocratic. And I think what ranked choice, all ranked choice voting does is get to, is, is empowers voters to say, my first choice is Ralph Nader, but if Ralph Nader can't win, then my second choice is Al Gore and having that vote actually count for them. And the second thing I like about it is that I think it provides an incentive for politicians to not spend the entirety of a campaign beating up on their opponent and trashing them. Uh, and instead realizing that if I want to be successful, I actually might need their votes in the second round uh, of this ranked choice voting runoff. So instead of attacking them, I'm going to focus on the things we have in common and try to actually appeal to that person's voters. Um, so anyway, we'll have a separate podcast where we flesh this out more fully, Reagan. Uh, Talk about impeachment. Uh, ben, Oregon is the only state in the nation that can't impeach a statewide elected official for high crimes and misdemeanors. And now Oregonians could make Oregon the 50th and final state in the nation until we add Puerto Rico or greater Idaho or some other state. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, Idaho is already part of, of uh, the United <laughs> States. I want to be clear about that. I do not want to get email from our many Idaho listeners. Um, but now we would be the 50th state to adopt the ability to impeach elected officials. And then you mentioned uh, a share 33 is dead, uh, but House Bill 2002 amended. Um, mm -hmm. That was part of the, the sort of grand bargain that ended the session. Okay, let's okay. speed. Uh, we should probably speed along, Ben. Yeah. I think we're probably going to make people go to sleep here. Let's go quickly here through. I'll do the next couple um, economic development, a couple of big ticket items, the CHIPS Act, uh, $260 million trying to make Oregon a competitive place in the semiconductor and microchip space, um, sort of trying to um, uh, earn our fair share of the, federal, the incredible amount of federal dollars that are being allocated uh, to, uh, what do we call it, onshore um, the semiconductor manufacturing industry and related. great buzzword Ben hashtag Silicon Forest hashtag Silicon Forest hashtag onshore hashtag uh, please stop talking about potato chips hashtag Gina Raimondo please give us money um, okay 
Oregon Kids Tax Credit, uh, tax credit for families struggling to make ends meet. This is actually a- Oh, very I forgot about one. this one, Ben. This is good. This is a very good one. Um, we mentioned the I-5 bridge in a previous section. In the education category, aside from the state school fund, $140 million in an early literacy investment that is um, built on the science of reading that is going to try to improve the way that we collectively um, teach kids how to read in this state. That's aligned to what the research and the best practices say. Um, ben, I grew up on phonics. Excited to see phonics come back. I phonics grew, making a comeback. I grew up on phonics too. And uh, I'm glad to see it coming back as well. Um, taxes, 988 hotline funding. This was, Reagan, what is notable about this bill? Um, well, it's a 40 cents uh, per line per year charge, if I'm remembering correctly, and it funds the federally created 988 hotline for suicide prevention. And um, the question on this really was oh, whether it was going to work like 911, where it just pays for the infrastructure to contact the police, um, which is all 911, the 911 charges that you see on your cell phone bill pay for. The 988 hotline pays for not just the infrastructure, but it also pays for um, uh, uh, well-trained workers in suicide prevention um, and other, you know, related um, uh, entities to support the services for those. So that is going to be implemented um, sometime in the near future, Ben, because I didn't look at the bill before I read this. I believe it was <laughs> the only three-fifths tax vote of the session. No, Ben, there were multiple three-fifths tax votes, but most of them didn't matter. There was the harvest tax that oh, got right, reauthorized. Right. Only new, new three-fifths new, yes, I think new is, probably, three is probably accurate, if I remember. Okay. Uh, Reagan, talk to us about healthcare and the environment. Ben, I know nothing about healthcare, um, except for that I haven't seen my doctor in a while. Um, and <laughs> I hope they do not email me after this. Uh, no, there was a disagreement about... Um, nurse staffing ratios in hospitals, concern from nurses, of course, about working conditions, concern from hospitals about the ever-increasing cost of health care. They came to an agreement and moved forward. Uh, and then we passed a governance board whose goal is to create a universal health care plan in Oregon and present their findings to the legislature in advance of the 2025 session, where I suspect a bill to implement that would appear. Uh, the environment, Ben, um, is still a hot topic. Uh, Oregonians care a lot about the environment. And so they passed a uh, number of environmental bills. Um, the main one being the climate, what I recall being the climate resilience package contained in House Bill 3409. That was basically an amalgamation of uh, a bunch of bills. Some of them were related to um, energy efficiency in buildings, others related to Oregon's Global Warming Commission, which has been renamed and retasked a little bit or retooled maybe. Um, and so those, uh, some of those priorities uh, move forward in the session. Uh, ben, do you know anything about the housing and homelessness crisis in Oregon and the bills related to them? House Bill 2001, this was early on in the session, one of the first major uh -huh. bills passed. Uh, Speaker Dan Rayfield made a commitment in his first speech before the legislature uh, that this was going to be done quickly in session. Um, Senate Bill 611 was a uh, a bill that created a 10% cap on rent increases. Um, and then a bill, a notable failure at the end of session was House Bill 3414, which uh, this was a, a priority of the governor's office and several Republican legislators, um, although it did have bipartisan support. Um, it passed relatively narrowly um, out of the uh, House with some Democrats most Democrats voting, uh, it was probably about half and half in terms of Democrats voting for and against uh, in the House. Um, gets, I think only one Republican voted no in the House. It then goes over to the Senate and in perhaps the most dramatic moment of the final days of session, um, House Bill 3414 dies on the Senate floor. It's one of three bills that died on the Senate floor on that last day, um, which is Again, pretty remarkable. That doesn't happen very. Fr it's fr it's uncommon for a single bill to die on the House or the Senate floor. For three to die is um, pretty wild, and it has a lot to do with who was on the floor at the time. So um, Senator Mark Meek was off the floor for one, which probably was the deciding vote. I think it was the deciding vote on that bill. Um, this was a yeah. Then uh, set the Republicans who left for the walkout and chose not to come back. One of them returning could have saved thirty four fourteen. 
uh, and allowed that bill to pass. So because of weird political dynamics at the end of session, three bills die in the Senate at the end, 34-14, um, which is essentially an urban growth boundary, land use, land supply bill uh, dies at the end of session. Or one Senate Democrat could have changed their mind, man. Technically true. Technically Say it again. True. One Senate Democrat could have changed their mind on the bill. That's too. true. That's true. One Senate Democrat could have changed their mind. Uh, okay, Reagan, talk <clears throat> to us about criminal justice, public safety, and the like. Ben, uh, crime doesn't pay, and the legislature made that clear in uh, in this session. They increased the charges for carrying a lot of fentanyl. Um, you could carry a lot, like 40 pills of fentanyl, and get a very minor Class C misdemeanor charge. You now get a Class A charge for those, if I remember correctly. House Bill 2005, AG and Democratic priority on gun reform was amended down back to its original form because... The bill was ghost guns, and then it took in uh, concepts in 2006 and 2007 that had to do with local control over where concealed handgun license holders could carry their firearms, and another concept that I'm currently forgetting. Um, Age. Oh, yes, the age to possess a firearm uh, being changed basically from 18 to 21 with some small exceptions for hunting and the like. Um, So the ghost gun uh, proposal moved forward. Um, public defenders, we reorganized the public defender uh, system. It's going to move to the governor's um, office. It's going to receive some additional funding, and they're going to change the model by which they pay those uh, attorneys. And then the statute of limitations for rape were changed so that you can now file criminal charges for um, rape. Um, that uh, current law is 12 years. Um, you have 12 years to file the charges from when the event occurred or is believed to occurred, that's not 20 years. Uh, all right, so miscellaneous bills, uh, and then uh, we will close out. There's a handful here. And by the way, hundreds of bills passed the session. I don't know, Reagan, do you know the total number of bills passed? I do, Ben, and if you give me a second, I will pull that. Okay, up. you pull that up. I will run down some of the mis- miscellaneous bills. One that's getting a lot of uh, media attention, self-serve gas. Not as, uh, it, it's more complicated than it sounds. It is not like we're getting rid of gas station attendance, um, but within certain boundaries, like in the metro area, for example, um, gas stations will be required to have some self-serve lanes as well as some attendant lanes. Um, freedom at the pump, Ben. Freedom at the pump. <laughs> Hashtag freedom at the pump. Uh, TikTok. Mm-hmm is no longer going to be allowed pending governor signature on state devices. Uh, great bill. Uh, really just a uh, top, top bill of the session. I think we could both agree on that, Reagan. Um, personal finance, Agreed. personal finance as a high school graduation requirement, that bill passed. And then uh, the, the last bullet point in the miscellaneous section just says potato. Uh, it is the, uh, <laughs> it been, it was a resolution to make the potato the state vegetable. Which one of one of the funnier moments of session that I recall was when Mark Owens. So this is, I believe, a Senator Bill Hansel priority bill. Um, Representative Mark Owens, also from rural eastern Oregon, also a farmer, uh, stands on the House floor and makes a motion to refer the resolution back to committee and amend it to make the state vegetable be the petunian uh, hybrid of the potato and onion which I confirmed does not actually exist. <laughs> Great. Then Great in the problem. Senate side, there were amendments drafted to carve up the potato and add additional ingredients to include every industry like bacon and dairy and others. And so the baked potato with additional items on top would be the state food. I'm not sure the exact goal of that, but there was an attempt to add additional industry um, there. But the uh, state vegetable is the potato. We do hope that this doesn't open up a new front of attack from the state of Idaho. Um, And Ben, those measures were just a handful of the 697 measures passed out of 2,970 introduced measures if you exclude memorials and resolutions 659 policy and or budget bills that's a lot of bills um so i will leave you my final thought on this and then uh we will close is pluribus am is one of my favorite newsletters uh it's basically a newsletter for what uh state legislators legislatures across the country are doing 
Um, and they end most newsletters with a quote of the day. And Oregon was featured in the quote of the day uh, this morning. Today is Tuesday, the 27th. Uh, and it was a quote from Oregon State Representative David Gomberg of the Oregon Coast, who um, spoke uh, on the last day of session moments before we adjourned. And the quote is, he's reflecting on the session. He says, there have been good days and there have been other days. And that rung true for me, Reagan. <laughs> ben, did Representative Gomberg do this while wearing a Hawaiian shirt and sunglasses, or was this on a different day? This was Hawaiian shirt. I think the sunglasses were were off for this. Um, but I was a proud member of the Hawaiian shirt caucus for the last two days. I do believe that Representative Gomberg did go to the dice with his sunglasses on to change the time you guys started. And I just thought that that was a fantastic uh, fantastic move, quite honestly. We, so. I believe we're scheduled to reconvene at one. He got back up to say we need to reconvene at two. And he said, we have forgot that the Senate needs to take their afternoon nap. And that's why we're getting pushed back an hour. <laughs> ben only needed our afternoon nap because we were so tired of reading emails from the house. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, folks, uh, we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening, Reagan. It's good to be back on the podcast with you. Uh, we're going to have many more good episodes this summer. Uh, stay tuned. Next week, we are going to be talking, if all things go as planned, um, about Steve Prefontaine and uh, his impact on the culture of the state of Oregon. So we're going to include this summer uh, a lot of politics, but some culture, business, um, tech, sports, et cetera, um, just to keep it interesting for our listeners. Uh, any closing thoughts, Reagan, from you? Please share um, the podcast with uh, any Oregon politics nerds that you know or people who are aspiring or Oregon politics nerds. We're happy to help bring people up to speed. You can subscribe in any podcast app. Just look for the Oregon Bridge or go to our YouTube channel and subscribe, and you should click the bell to get notified you can leave comments there about how ugly the wallpaper is behind me <laughs> i am aware um it's on the list to fix but it's pretty far down the list and i don't like activating the green screen mode in zoom because it's not very good um so you're gonna have to continue to do it do what i do if you don't want to look at it and just listen via audio but i know that buddy and ben would be very excited if you still subscribed to our youtube channel which i think is approaching a thousand subscribers it hasn't passed that right Right, no, ben? I think we got a little ways to go. Uh, and here's my advice for you, Reagan. Don't read the comments. What's that? Don't read the comments. Don't read the comments. Nothing ben, the people, comments. many people are saying things and we should be able to respond to them. And I want to know if people have responses. If you think there was a bill that we missed, you can put that in the comments. You can email Ben and myself. We probably won't do very much with that email, but I will make a promise that I will open it and start reading it. I don't know if I'll finish reading profiles, it, but I hope I will. Profiles encourage Reagan Knope. All right. It is time for us to end this podcast. Thank you all for listening and see you back here next week.